Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's webinar with Maslow. I'm Leila, one of the campaign managers here at Burcho. And just before we get started, I would love to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land I'm based on today. Burcho is based on the, on the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, and we pay our respects to the elders press, present and emerging. Burcho is working with Maslow in a crowdsourced funding offer. The information and discussion here today is for information and purpose only, should not be considered as advice or as a recommendation to invest. Please do your own, own research and consider the offer doc and the general CSF risk warning before investing. Now, how today's session is gonna run. Kane and the team is gonna take us through a presentation around 15 minutes. We're gonna learn all about the business, the numbers they have achieved, and the plans after the race. Then we're gonna switch to a Q&A session. So if you have a look at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you're gonna see a little Q&A bubble. If you have a question during the session, please pop it in the box and we're gonna answer at the end. Lastly, we are recording the session. So if you have to jump off, we're gonna send a recording around by the end of the day. That's it from me, because you're not here to see me, Kane. Thanks, Leila. Um, welcome, everyone. Um, I'm joined today by um, uh, my co-founder, Mina Kelbert, and our head of financial wellness, Lacey Filipich. Um, our third co-founder, Caitlin, has a six-month-old baby who is sick today, so she won't be joining us. Um, we're also joined by um, Dr. JP Monk, who is uh, the general counsel at In One Bank and has had a, num a wealth of experience in uh, the industry, least of which uh, as, a, as a former regulator um, for APRA. So JP has been on both sides of, um, of, of the road. Um, I'll get Mina. Do you want to do a quick intro um, and then over to Lacey? Yep, I just had to find the unmute button. <laughs> but yes, um, basically my name is Mina Calvert. I've been in banking and finance for 18 years as an engineer. Um, I've come on to Maslow as the CTO, um, primarily because it aligns with my values, you know, benevolence, integrity, ethics, non-maleficience. Um, to me, financial inequality underpins many of the challenges to global sustainability. So to me, positive change needs to address the inequalities in the financial system. And, uh, with Maslow, I guess we can be the change we want to see in the world. You know, together we can achieve more than we ever could individually. Awesome. Thanks, Peter. Um, Lacey, do you want to maybe tell us a little bit about your background and why um, your joining our team was a fairly significant change after 14 years? <laughs> yeah, those 14 years of running my own business called Money School. So I'm a financial educator, which is a self-appointed title in Australia. We don't have a formal financial educator pathway. Uh, lots of different people get into it. I'm actually an engineer by training, chemical engineer, and worked in mining and management consulting for many years. So not your traditional pathway to talking about finance. In those 14 years, I've become more and more aware of the systemic challenges that people face. And look, when I started out, I feel like I was a bit ignorant. I had a very strong focus on personal responsibility. I wanted everybody to learn all the skills they needed to manage their money. And the further I get along, the more I realize how much systemic change is needed. It doesn't matter how much skill I give to people, they're still playing on an uneven playing field. And that makes it really hard for people to become financially secure. And we really, really need people to be financially secure, if not independent in society, because they're able to contribute so much more. It actually costs us less. So if you're a capitalist, you want that too. Okay. <laughs> um, so Maslow's the first financial uh, fintech that I have come across that removes the conflict of interest piece that has meant that with money school, I've had to stay independent. I find it very difficult to deliver financial education if I've got any kind of affiliation or any kind of even strategy endorsement. I'm famously agnostic. Um, choose your own adventure. Maslow being independent means I can actually focus on doing the financial education where it is most needed at the point of sale when you're just starting to Google it and you're going, do I need this insurance or this product? So I'm really excited about the ability to combine that financial capability improvement with the process of buying the product because I think we'll get the biggest improvement we can for outcomes. Wonderful. Thanks, Lacey. Um, so the way today is going to go, uh, we're uh, moving from an assumed point that people viewing have also watched the nine minute video on virtual. So there's an assumed knowledge there. Um, but from there, I've had a number of phone calls um, over the last couple of two weeks. And uh, those phone calls have um, gone quite well, but I've chosen some uh, common questions from those calls. And JP is going to do an intro of him, himself and why he's supporting Maslow uh, in a second. And he's going to run through some of those questions that I will answer. And then after that, we'll uh, pass over to the audience for any questions you've got. Thanks, JP. 
Thanks, Kane. Uh, so yeah, uh, so I'm JP Monk, uh, or John Paul, but uh, that's a bit too long sometimes. Um, so I've been in uh, financial services for a bit over 17 years uh, in a full-time capacity, uh, and I've been moonlighting as an academic for more than a decade uh, of that time. Uh, um, so uh, as much as I desperately tried not to become an accountant, I became qualified uh, twice in that field. I was a recovering lawyer and no longer recovering. I'm still pretty active in practice now, um, and also cover uh, risk and uh, compliance aspects. Uh, so all the fun stuff is how I usually uh, lead with that. Um, and for my sins, I spent some time at APRA uh, post the GFC. So got to see, um, let's say the back end of some of the really fun stuff uh, to see, well, what needs to change and why. Um, obviously in Australia, we've seen, or not obviously, the, the Royal Commission um, and the, the fallout from it and some of the themes that were emanating from it. But it still feels like uh, there's a lot of work yet to be done. And whether or not that's going to come from the industry itself, um, from its regulator or from its self-regulation, you know, is less apparent, I suppose. Uh, and the urgency behind it, uh, you know, is potentially uh, just not there as much as it can be. Um, there is the opportunity for new entrants to the market, licenses to be granted and whatnot. Um, but we've seen a few examples that haven't gone all that well. So some of my questions will be a little bit pointed around uh, how is this going to be different? Um, how can that change actually come from something uh, that needs to uh, effectively from a startup um, take off, uh, get to growth and maturity, uh, and then start to incrementally deliver that change and deliver on the promises that um, that it's made uh, in a way that it can be sustainable in the long run. So um, I believe it can. I, I think it needs to happen wherever it comes from. So uh, I guess I've put my money where my mouth is, but whatever I say and imply uh, is not financial advice. So uh, we've had that disclaimer already. Thanks. Uh, Layla, but um, we'll probably hear it a few more times, given that we've got some on the line who are uh, in that uh, pocket of the industry. Um, so that's uh, for me, but uh, can I let you go through a bit more detail and um, we can start with the grilling. Yeah, sure. Not a problem. So I'm just thinking, JP, maybe it's best if you start off with some general questions that you um, want to lead with, and then we'll go through the, the list of prepared ones. Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess the the obvious one, the shortest one, why? Why? <laughs> Um, so as you and I both know, and many people who followed us for a while know, uh, we believe that the conflict in financial services is um, a significant problem. Conflict being that obviously financial products are selling money and companies under the incumbent model are incentivized to give more to their, uh, to their shareholders by undermining the outcome for their customers. Unless you remove that conflict piece, you can't actually serve or completely serve your customers' interests. And historically, when you have an incentive to undermine an outcome for profit, you do that. And that is why we see um, this sort of feedback loop of, of decay and financial products getting more expensive or um, of a lower quality. So there's a number of reasons um, why, in you know, the direct one-on-one -on -one customer perspective, we, we want to solve that. We can deliver better and cheaper outcomes. But then there's also the holistic societal piece around the fact that the finance industry is now the world's largest industry. Um, it contributes more to um, wealth inequality than any other industry. It's very extractive. It's um, grown exponentially since 1983. It's now 25% of GDP. It was 8.3% back then. Um, and there's no evidence that the growth of the broader industry, sorry, that the growth of the industry has grown the broader economy and plenty of evidence to suggest that it, it's done the opposite and, you know, is extracting from society to fuel its own growth. So that's we're, we're really here to solve that. And that's where we speak about uh, Maslow as, as, as building um, the world's largest um, publicly owned utility to replace the, the retail finance industry. Nice and uh, interesting separation. Uh, and look, I think that video that's already out there uh, addresses some of that, which is awesome. So anyone that hasn't seen that yet, encourage them to, to take a look at it uh, in some more detail. Um, I'll be more pointed as well and say, well, it's already oversubscribed. Why are we having this conversation? How much does it help to go further? Yeah, look, the, the whole point of doing uh, the virtual raise is to get on our cap table, um, basically industry leaders, people like JP, people like before Lacey joined the team, people like Lacey and people like Mina. And, you know, we, we've got a, a growing list of very experienced um, industry professionals. And that's about having, um, establishing some validity and credibility behind what we're doing. Um, the, the gargantuan size of our mission um, warrants having really senior levels of support um, and backing in the industry. And that's why one of the reasons we wanted to give people the opportunity to invest through virtual but also um, one of the most wonderful things anyone who's ever built a startup will know is that getting advice is very expensive especially in financial services whether it's lawyers accountants 
lawyers and lawyers. Um, and so uh, we've got a number of, um, you know, some of some of the country's sort of best subject matter experts on our cap table now. And that means I can pick up the phone and call JP or I can call Luke Raven, one of the country's best compliance experts or Brad Kelly, one of the one of the best payments um, professionals in Australia. And I can ask a question without getting billed for that, basically. So we're here pretty much to use our um, people on our cap table. But it's also about getting support from people who really believe in our model. And, you know, JP is a really good example of that. He was one of the first people um, who uh, understood, um, I guess, the opportunity that Maslow represents for the public. And so it's about um, giving everyone who wants in the opportunity to do that. Um, we'll still need to be raising capital uh, in the, you know, in the months and years ahead. It costs a lot to build a fintech even if we're doing it, doing it efficiently. Um, but yeah, we're, we're going as, as, as much as we can uh, through virtual. And then after that, we'll um, use that credibility and, and um, uh, what we bring together to go out and raise money from some larger, more aligned, oh, not more aligned, but larger and more aligned investors. Cool, thanks. Uh, so I'll go through um, some of the, the questions we can rattle through and then um, we can take any from the, the audience as well. But um, first off, you've said Maslow won't make any uh, financial products. So how's it going to how's it going to make money? So we won't make any profit from financial products. We're going to provide financial products on our platform uh, the same way Costco provides toilet paper and peanut butter. Now, they're obviously very different things, but the conflict exists in financial services where you are being incentivized at the decision point a customer makes. And you have you, that positions you to influence that decision. So we step back from that and say, we want to provide financial products on our platform in a way that doesn't provide us any incentive to influence a customer to choose any or, or, or other and bring them into a platform. Customers still have to choose, still have to pay for what they choose on the platform, um, but they pay Maslow one fee, a, a subscription fee, um, which will probably be monthly um, to access a, a suite of cost price financial products that delivers us no benefit whatsoever. So that's where we get that term, um, you know, Maslow is a safe place to navigate money. Cool. And have you got any projections in terms of revenue, for example, and what valuation that leads to? Yeah, sure. So um, projections are um, prohibited under crowdsource funding legislation, but we can speak about, uh, I guess, what's in market already with some of our uh, some of those we consider our closest competitors or um, comparisons. So if we have a look at, you know, UpBank, I think most people know um, the UpBank story, and that was essentially that a um, you know a digital agency led by Dom Pym went to to Bendigo and said, hey, let's build a brand and use that as a way to um, use the technology we've already built and that we can build to acquire a different kind of customer than Bendigo's brand would otherwise allow. And there, you know, there are a lot of banks that are experiencing branding and aging demographic issues with their customers. And, you know, Bendigo is no different. So UpBank um, went to market with a, you know, an indie north side uh, brand that implied a rebellion. Uh, it was, uh, you know, it was essentially this is banking, but not how your parents did it. And they've been really successful. They acquired 800,000 customers in five years. So if we have a look at that as sort of a yardstick, um, we'd like to uh, target, or we are targeting a, mil a million customers in, in, in Australia within that same, same time frame. Um, where UpBank provided banking, and that was pretty much all they did, we want to add on to that. So if we have a look at, you know, um, delivering on that implied rebellion, we go one step further because Up didn't change the fundamental relationship between a customer and their bank. And, you know, obviously it's since been sold to Bendigo and the whole point of that was to, you know, um, sell those customers to a bank. We are being owned by our customers and we're exiting to our customers. So this is a, a rebellion that we're sort of delivering on rather than just implying. Cool. Yeah, thank you for that. And that leads me to the next sort of segue. Um, I noticed there's a cap on investor returns. So why and um, how will they be realized? Yeah, so the cap on investor returns is um, basically to limit the extractive elements of startups. Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of discussion around um, sustainable economic practices at the moment. And we are building Maslow for society and the world. Um, we want to build the world's largest publicly owned utility and, and have that be the finance industry. Uh, we don't want to do that for a small group of shareholders. We don't want to all get ridiculously rich. And, you know, as founders, we all have caps on our return just as our investors do. Um, in this round, it's, it's 200x. And, you know, it's a bit of a compromise. We have to offer a risk adjusted return to uh, investors. Um, and that will get smaller. That cap will get less and less um, with each consecutive raise. 
Um, but in terms of how we actually pay out that cap over time, um, it can be realized by accumulative dividends. So we have, we do have quite a, we believe we have quite a profitable model and we can talk about that in a second, but we'll pay out that, uh, those returns um, via accumulative dividends, or we can also facilitate lump sum payments. Um, investors can sell their shares. Um, that's, that's also allowed under our constitution. Um, but yeah, it'll basically be dividends over time, or it might be that um, we get together with a group of our customers in five years time and, and offer to buy out some of our shares. So that's maybe an option as well. Cool. Um, and where do you want the company to be in five years' time? Yeah. So coming back to you know looking at UpBank as as that sort of that yardstick. I mean, what UpBank did was was in, was incredible. They had such uh, amazing success. Um, we'd like to take that further um, and deliver on that you know, rebellion that they implied. And yeah. So you know we want want to have a million customers in Australia by that point, but also expect to be rolling out into other markets well before then. You know, Australia is yes, it's an important market, probably the hardest market to launch a fintech into. Um, but it is it is just a step for us, you know, to become uh, the world's largest publicly owned utility. We will have to look um, beyond Australia. Gotcha. Um, moving a little bit there, you've said something about a banking partner. So can you disclose who that is? Yeah, um, no. So we can't disclose it at the moment. Uh, we'll be announcing the banking partner in the next few months. So we've signed an agreement with them. It's confidential for now. Um, but um, in the next couple of months, we'll announce uh, a banking strategy that we'll be pursuing in market. Um, and, you know, as I've, I've already spoken about our bank, I guess it's fair to assume that our partner bank is very interested in the acquisition of, you know, a million plus deposit customers. Cool. On that happy topic, um, you spoke about UpBank. So um, why do you think you'll be able to replicate that success? Yeah, look, UpBank spoke to a growing feeling in the market around uh, customers wanting more from the brands that they engage in. Um, you know, we're, we're very, um, I guess, aware of um, the discussion around environmental sustainability, um, very important in 2024. Um, we're starting to have conversations around economic sustainability, around the sustainability of the companies that we engage with and support. And a lot of people are talking about, you know, things like capitalism 2.0 and, um, you know, capitalism with soul and all these sorts of things. And Maslow goes one step further than a lot of companies does in that there is an underlying purpose for what we are doing beyond just paying out our shareholders. And obviously that's an important part. We have to be profitable and having a profitable model is a non-negotiable to have um, impact on a large scale. But we aren't going to sell out to um, a large bank. We are going to exit to our customers. So we think we'll speak to customers that really do demand more of, of the businesses that they engage in. Cool. Um, on that, so in your offer document, you've said you can deliver a banking product for just over a million dollars. So can you explain how you'll do that when historically uh, costs can be um, a multitude of tens or even hundreds of that figure? Yeah, I might pass over to Mina to answer that question. Give her some airtime. Cool. Yeah, okay. Sorry, just checking my mic works. Um, look, I could, I could talk about this question for at least 30 minutes, but I'll just quickly break it down. So I don't deliver technology. I deliver value enabled by technology. And the goal here is to start creating this return on investment by providing tangible value as soon as possible. The goal is to focus on what delivers the real value that the stakeholders want, right? So. Delivering a digital product for just over a million dollars sounds advantageous, but it comes down to removing the complexity and the uncertainty or the, the things that will cause issues around delivering the product. It's about managing our risk early on to prevent issues in the future and increasing our chance of success. So firstly, we have a banking partner that is a true partner in the sense of the word, world. Sense of what? Sense of the word. Let's go with both. You know, both of us have interest in ensuring that the, we, we get the best mutual outcomes, you know, shared ownership and interest with stakeholders increases the chance of project success. Secondly, no matter whether a banking product is built in house or off the shelf, the hidden cost is integration in legacy systems and incumbent infrastructure. So some banks have decades old systems. You know, the way we bank has changed significantly with the introduction of mobile phones and the internet and increased security threats. You know, it's like imagining plugging your iPhone into a Commodore 64. It can't happen without first significant expenditure or overhaul. So the older that the systems are, the more incompatible they are, uh, the more inelegant that the solution is, and the more constraints that are placed on delivery leading to delays or failure. The benefit that we have with our banking partner is our integration is not constrained by legacy technology, but it's enabled through modern cloud-based infrastructure. And this allows us to be agile, adaptable, and forward-looking. Thirdly, we're not a bank. We're a FinTech with a banking partner. 
And while obviously we have to fulfill our obligations to our partners to ensure compliance, including things like CPS 230, 234, most importantly uh, to our customers around privacy, security, integrity, and availability, we don't necessarily have the regulatory overheads of a bank. So to put it in perspective, product development is a strategic endeavor, complying with regulation is compulsory. And so for banks, a significant number of funds is diverted away from technology towards regulation and compliance, namely things like capital adequacy. So that's to overall ensure the stability of the financial system. I remember it was probably about 80% of uh, expenditure from what I last heard. And lastly, as a digital banking consultant, it's a path that I've walked many times. And I have the knowledge, resources, processes, partnerships, and technology to accelerate our delivery past commonly assumed expectations. I've delivered world-leading um, banking solutions for less. And more importantly, I have the, the sense of responsibility to ensure success. And I guess all I can say is just watch this space. <laughs> nice. Thank you. Um, so flip to a couple of other canned ones before we go to the uh, the floor. Um, so why is this a crowd fund instead of raising from venture capital investors? <laughs> um, VCs don't love the cap on return. Um, there's a number of reasons for that. One, they are greedy. Lots of people are greedy. There's nothing necessarily wrong with that until you look at the extractive element of that. We have to have a cap on our return returns um, so that we don't just make a few founders like us and a few investors exceedingly rich. There's no real point in trying to replace the layer of the retail finance industry that exists today with a new one if we don't change who owns that. So the cap is really important to us. Now, um, venture capitalists will say a lot of things about what they're targeting. Um, you know, it used to be 100x, then it was 200x, and now it's uh, returning their fund from each investment. Um, the 200x cap was a bit of a problem for some of them. Um, there's also issues around, um, it's a tacit, uh, I guess investing in a company that has a cap on returns is a tacit acknowledgement that there is extraction at the root of what, what venture capital does. Um, and that is, you know, extracting um, benefit or, or, or value out of a market and then, you know, using it to make a bunch of, of shareholders um, wealthy and then usually leave the company often not in a, a very good way. So that's that's the reason for the CSF. Gotcha. Makes good sense. Um, and then after this virtual round closes, what's next? Yeah. So speaking into, um, you know, one of the reasons for the CSF. <clears throat> Uh, we've got a 100 and I think 62 as of this morning investors. There's some very impressive people on that list. So VCs are, you know, they're commercial like anyone else um, and they'll accept um, a valid business proposition. And one of the things that um, people, one of the, some of the questions that get raised when we walk into VCs or any, any investment meeting is, you know, do you have the capability to do this? It's a fairly, fairly massive mission. Um, what, you know, what, what comfort have we got that you're able to execute on it? And so part of doing the CSF was about getting um, industry leaders and we'll disclose who that list is by name um, once we get consent from, from those people at the conclusion of the round. And that will speak into the media we do around deep industry support. And it, it ticks that validation box in terms of does this company have the competencies or capabilities to execute on this mission? And a lot of the time VCs are generalists and so they don't know how to answer those questions. But when you've got some very well-known industry leaders backing you, that helps, it helps them do that. Um, so after, sorry, after the round, um, we will be um, moving forward with, with building our, 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 um, uh, our first products and um, our first acquisition strategies. It's probably best to have a look in the offer document for a detailed explanation on what happens under our minimum scenario and what ha happens under our maximum. Um, there's quite a, quite a bit of detail in there. Um, but we'll also be looking to raise um, further capital on the back of um, the CSF uh, in mid to, to, to late in the year. Um, from some uh, fairly well-known impact investors um, to take us to that next level. Sounds exciting. All right. Well, thanks for that. Um, and I've seen there's already some really good uh, questions coming up in the Q&A. So any attendees who wanted to throw more into the pile, please keep them coming uh, thick and fast. Um, I'll start with one uh, really in the order that they came through in. But um, one person said, congratulations on hitting the first funding target. Love the vision and plan, but with such a big range between the minimum and max targets for the raise. Uh, if you only hit on the low end, are you still confident you'll achieve the goals? Uh, it's touched on in the document, but um, we'd love to hear a bit more about it. Yes, so um, coming back to what I just previously said with the minimum and maximum scenarios, um, we've got plans um, to execute on for all, all those scenarios and, and in between. Um, 
fintechs that build a community first have a lot more success. Um, we're actually quite good at community building. Um, Lacey's done a lot on this. Lacey, maybe you can speak more about what we'll be, we'll be doing on the customer acquisition front, even from a minimum um, raise perspective, which essentially just gets um, leveraged in a maximum scenario. I'm really excited about this bit because I've been doing lots of trial and error over the last 14 years, trying to teach people about money. And I'm looking forward to being able to bring that to this team and do the community building alongside it. It's something that I've stayed away from purely from personal choice, uh, but I, I think it's the secret source. And like you say, good community building is really important for our product to be successful. I'm going to be focusing on delivering things that are going to give value before we even have products to offer. So that's going to be financial education and decision-making resources. So we're going to use a lot of what I've already done in money school. It's very low cost to execute because of all the experience I bring. So much of it's been in how to deliver a really quality learning experience, how to create really engaging video videos, how to make things accessible and digestible. And we're going to focus those on the people that need it most at the moment. So we're going to look at the debt side of things. How can we help people get out of any of that bad consumer debt? And including who do they need to talk to? You know, there's a lot of knowledge about financial advisors and accountants, but not a lot, I would say generally about financial counseling or the financial information service at Centrelink. So I'm really looking forward to getting something like that out there really quickly. And look, when I talk about the experience I've had in money school, I filmed my get out of debt course. Uh, it's 30 minutes long. I did it in between breastfeeding and naps for my baby. It's the lowest quality production you can imagine. It's had over 5,000 people enroll in it and I've spent zero money on that. It's literally all been organic. It's got four and a half stars. So uh, it's uh, when I say it's something you can do cheaply, you can do it cheaply. You can do it to a higher quality, which a little bit of the capital will help us do with the video quality. We're also going to encourage people with critical thinking and critical reasoning because so much of personal finance is a choose your own adventure story. There's not a lot of really hard and fast rules. So I'm looking forward to building some decision trees and holding our money debates event, which we did back in 2020, had a great result. We had 45 different professionals in all sorts of fields from academic research to financial advisors, to counselors, to educators and coaches. Um, and that gets people thinking and learning. And to that last point as well, I'm really looking forward to building a strong community for those professionals. At the moment, we've got these pockets of excellence. We've got academics doing incredible research. We've got incredible startups doing amazing tech for people. We've got financial counselors, financial advisors, accountants, all sorts, coaches, educators like me doing incredible work. At the moment, we've got the Money Awareness and Inclusion Awards, which is an international award that started three years ago that gives visibility. But I'm really looking forward to building a community of practice, which I think is, speaks to our aim of improving the community for everybody and bringing all those different sources of information and different perspectives in together. So that's some of the stuff we're going to be working on. It's all fairly low cost. I'm pretty well advanced in that because of the amount of time I've spent in the industry. Um, so I think we're sort of going to hit the ground running. That's what I'm hoping for. I think right. it's I think it's important to mention as well that no uh, company in Australian history has ever been in position like we are in that they are able to build um, financial uh, wellness and, and resources uh, without having a vested interest in um, the behaviour or the decisions that it influences in people. Um, if you have a look at any, in any fintech that's launching um, that is uh, built on the incumbent model and extracts money or, or revenue from commissions or product placement fees or whatever it might be, they're remunerated from the um, selection um, and consumption of products. That really changes the way or, or limits the way that you can present information. So we are in a position where we are able to bring uh, honest, truthful, unbiased information to market. And the market hasn't, quite, frankly, hasn't seen that in a setting at, at any beyond the um, sort of the not-for-profit or the government spaces. And both of those, um, I guess, areas um, aren't as... Um, uh, aggressive with the way they, they, they go to market with that as, as we can be. So that's a really big opportunity for us. Gotcha. Sounds good. Um, slightly different angle. Uh, in the offer doc, there's no mention of uh, short-term or personal loans in the MVP. So why leave that out? Yeah, first, uh, pretty pretty simply, um, the target market we're going for is really similar to the one that, 
that UpBank's gone from. That's a younger clientele, you know, as a sub 40 year old, um, they're people who are traditionally um, or at the moment uh, struggling to um, see a pathway towards home ownership. And that obviously means that mortgages are, are not a priority uh, for, for those customers. And so that's important too. But if we have a look at the tolerance of those customers for high interest loans, it's quite small. That market is very um, uh, uh, debt averse, especially around those high interest loans. We also have, you know, a lot of fintechs, whether it be um, whether it be UpBank or, or, or others, have stayed away from credit cards. I mean, buy now, pay later. People know I'm not a huge fan of that. But buy now, pay later, stayed away from credit cards. The whole positioning was, you know, credit cards are bad. And they created that um, rhetoric in the market quite successfully. And now they're issuing credit cards. Um, but the point is those, those high interest loans don't align with our, uh, our view to help people. Um, they are the most extractive. And so it's a, they'll be much further down our list um, in terms of products if, if they appear on those, on those product, on those, on that list at all. Gotcha. Thanks. Yeah, that's helpful. Um, there's a question as well from the audience. Uh, what separates Maslow from uh, mutual banks, such as Bank Australia? Um, so mutual banks usually charge a surplus to build capital. Uh, they don't have any other means in the market, so they can't raise uh, unless they demutualize, I suppose, is the implication there. So these mutuals usually charge fees that are proportional to the risk. So if customers are all charged a flat fee, um, how would that risk be allocated? Uh, look, product formation in the different silos of financial services is obviously different. Um, so I won't get into the specific um, silos, but if we have a look at um, some of the similarities and differences um, between the mutuals, uh, a mentor of mine was the CEO at Gateway Bank and I met Paul uh, Thomas um, in the early days of iterating around how we would build a model that um, factored in the strengths of the mutuals um, and, you know, um, engineered around or away from the weaknesses. And, you know, their inability to raise capital is, is, is a huge problem. Um, but also, you know, I've, I've said before that I think um, the mutual model, the credit union model, which, whichever one, you know, you want to you speak to, um, it, was a, it was a digital product that arrived in an analog time. Time. And we're seeing, um, I guess, the result of that now in market where these companies that have been around for a really long time, um, usually on the back of either, um, you know, co-op groups or, um, uh, you know, credit unions, you know, half of them came out of Commonwealth Bank. But if we have a look at their issues today, their issues are that their customers are aging or, or dying, quite frankly, and they, they don't have the capital they require to innovate and compete um, with the for-profit um, players and the scale. And so if we have a look at Maslow is a hybrid between some of the strengths and, and, and avoiding the weaknesses. And so we are, we are, we start off being part customer owned. And so we don't become fully customer owned until probably about 10 or 15 years as a minimum. And if we have a look at what the purpose of that is, it's so that we can sell that equity, all of the equity that exists in the company for a, a you know, an implied return or with a cap and, and we can pay out those investors over time. And that's what it gives us the ability to raise capital to um, behave and act uh, in ways that mutuals can't, whilst also speaking to the eventual um, goal of Maslow to exit to our customers and have Maslow be, um, you know, uh, for the benefit of society, not just um, our shareholders. All right. Thank you. Um, another one, will Maslow members have to sign up to the bank providing the financial offering or will it be handled in the Maslow platform, including the know your customer process? So that sounds like that's including the onboarding side. It uh, sounds like a compliance question, which I, I love. So Mina and I talk about this a lot. Um, it's from our perspective, it's a non-negotiable that you do KYC and onboarding once. Now there are, we've got strategies around implementing that, um, but we will be aiming to do KYC at a standard that exceeds all of the partners that we work with so that they only have to do it once on the Maslow platform. Mina, have I missed anything that you want to cover there? Uh, yeah, no, well, basically, I guess, uh, banking or oh, financial services is a risk-based endeavor. Um, obviously, it, it's it's about managing risk, and I think there's been a movement to give consumers a lot more power over over their identity and over their their banking. And we can see things like open banking popping up, CDI, consumer data, right? Um, and then also you have things like uh, digital ID, which is coming in. The biggest issue that comes down to, we will have a number of partners on our platform. Obviously, for customer experience, we want to allow onboarding. You know, know your customer or know your business at least once, but it needs to be within the risk appetite of our partners. Um, so until the world changes around the areas of AML and CTF regulation, we'll we'll have to do whatever we can to ensure that you know our, our customers are safe and our partners are safe. Wonderful. 
Sounds fair. All right. Um, there was a question. How will you make a profit if you, I think if you won't make a margin on products on your platform? Yeah, cool. So um, I, sometimes uh, we are stitching together a number of different models and some people um, can rightfully assume that we talk about uh, financial products without profit. Um, we aren't using financial products to extract profit or, or income. Um, we're using them to establish value. So if we have a look at, let's say Netflix as an example, Netflix um, uses its, um, its, its content shows and movies as um, tools to establish value that customers then pay for. Um, you know, before Netflix, you would go down to the, you know, the, the, the video rental or DVD rental shop and you would sort of pick a product. And the product was that one video or DVD now we see the product as the platform and we pay for that we there's an extra layer for us in that the customers will pay for the products they use on platform so whilst um, we're not being remunerated from those products uh, the customers are paying their own way in respect to those so we charge an access fee which is where we source our revenue much like costco members pay an annual membership to enter um, the warehouse and, and choose the products they want and pay for them at checkout. Um, and, you know, we'd expect to charge an average of about $240 a year per customer at about the five year mark. Um, so if we were to hit a million customers at five years, that's revenue of $240 million. Now, if we have a look at the business model, it's an attractive one because it doesn't have to cover many expenses. So to administer and manage, um, you know, a million customers, it's probably fair to assume we'd have about 200 uh, employees on an average of, of let's say 150,000 a year. Um, that's 30 million in expenses. If we have a look at you know other expenses on top of that, let's double that to be conservative in terms of operating expenses. We're still left with 180 million dollars worth of revenue, um, but we don't have a, a large cost base because customers are paying for the products they choose on platform. They're still cheaper because we're not um, delivering that profit margin. We're able to bring in all sorts of products um, under um, or, or within in the platform because we don't we're not conflicted out because we're not remunerated by one or the other um, and that's where the customer value um, really speaks for itself but in terms of the attractiveness of the business model or the revenue model um, we don't have to cover a lot with um, the revenue we take in gotcha so it sounds like uh, that one is not forced to act with a particular partner or not and in fact the whole value of the platform is to be as agnostic as possible um, so that the customer gets to choose what well, yeah, I think one of the, the things that speaks to as well is the optionality um, our model allows us, you know, the banking, um, let's say we, we go to market with an insurance provider in six months time, um, the, uh, let's say it's general insurance, the offer that we can negotiate on behalf of our customers is going to be um, different when we've got 10,000 customers versus when we've got 100,000. And Maslow's relationship is with the customer um, and the customer is paying us to provide them financial products that we don't have a vested interest in. So we work for the customer. So your $10 or $5 or $20 a month is paying for us to not make money off the products. And that allows us to say six months or six years into our journey, hey, we can get a better deal by taking our 100,000 customers to a different insurer or underwriter and saying, hey, you either need to improve on the product you're offering our customers now or we're going to leave. And at the end of the day, customers don't care who they insure with or who they bank with. I hate to tell the banks. Um, they need a great user experience. They need to be able to trust the product and it has to be um, appropriately priced. They're the three considerations. And so if we do that and we're able to use the volume, our growing volume to negotiate better deals for our customers, it's in, it's, it's in our interest to do that because we are using our financial products to establish value, not to extract profit. And so if we can deliver more value with a different financial product that uh, additional volume has allowed us to negotiate on behalf of our customers, we're incentivized to do that. So you mean that you're not going to try and sell me a different product because the margin you get is better than the other one? Absolutely, which is pretty oh, much how the entire industry is defined now. All right. Yeah, thanks for that. Um, all right. So next up, apart from capital raising, what does the panel think that Maslow's biggest challenge will be? Um, <laughs> capital raising is a big one. Uh, there are a lot of losers in the industry from Maslow's success. Lots of winners in um in society, um, we, you know, fi the, the finance industry is owned by about 5% of the world, um, but services everyone. So we benefit all of the world, and but there's a pretty, um, pretty vocal 5% that don't want us to succeed. And those often are the ones with the money. So um, funding is a huge 
a huge challenge for us. Um, there are a lot of founders that run companies that might invest in what we do, but if we succeed, then their, their core business might struggle. So funding's a big one, and we've had to look to some pretty um, creative and, and innovative solutions for that. Um, the CSF is a stepping stone to that to give us the credibility to make some pretty bold statements and claims, um, but also to position with some aligned investors. And we, we have... Um, we have our eyes on who we expect um, incoming investors will be later in the year. Obviously, nothing's guaranteed, um, but we're talking about large scale global impact investors that have sort of household names um, that want to do more than they can do with philanthropy and want to do more than ordinary startups can do. So funding is, is a big one. Um, we, you know, I think JP, you pointed out that a lot of people um, you know, are really vying for us to fail. Um, so that has to be acknowledged as a risk too. That sounds fun. Um, on that topic, I mean, uh, we haven't s touched on acquisitions yet as part of this, but I mean, that comes in many forms. What if one of those uh, lovely parties decides that they want to acquire Maslow so they can choke it to death and bury it? Uh, or, you know, what if a benevolent party wants to acquire it or a part of it so that they can actually contribute to the journey? Is that possible under the constitution? Will that be entertained? Uh, will it be resisted at all costs? What's the yeah. idea? I think it's important to note that um, money and experiences shape and change people. And so we put a lot of time and effort over the last three years into creating a document, the constitution, that defines what can and can't happen for Maslow. I think we all are aware that um, wealthy founders um, that, you know, become billionaires change and there's one I'm sort of coming to mind at the moment that would like to say he's trying to help the world that might might not be about that. And so we wanted to build in um, these parameters from day one. So first and foremost, all of us, so Mina, Kate and myself, um, we have a cap on our returns, just like incoming investors. And so at some point we are forced to transfer our equity to the customer pool. And that was because if we allowed ourselves, well, from, from my perspective, I have the view that if I allowed myself um, that decision at a later time, if I've made lots of money, I might not want to do that anymore. And so we have a number of um, parameters built into the constitution that define what can and can't happen to Maslow. And one of them is to prevent um, banks or whatever it might have coming in and wanting to buy us. So first and foremost, the customer um, uh, component. So we start off 5%, but that will grow over time as our private investors are capped out. So any incoming, any company that wanted to buy us, let's say they managed to buy a minority or even a majority at some point, which is practically impossible, um, they would still also have the customers and those they're going to have to take those customers across. So at any point, those customers are still going to be the beneficiaries of Maslow and there's no way around that. Nice. Thank you. Um, bit of a longer one, uh, global uptake of AI chatbots to reduce the cost of customer service. And something I wanted to touch on as well is it sounds like there's some, some of your assumptions is how many customers you're going to get and that uptake, you know, is that helpful? Does that make it more scalable? And the question uh, specifically asked, will consumers be able to talk to a person if they need help or is it only going to be email, AI or live chat? Yeah. Um, so customer service is, you know, this opportunity uh, to have that, 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 I guess that front face with your customer. And, you know, at the time you're asking for help from a company, you're already stressed or strained because something has happened that's usually a negative. Um, so AI has been really good in terms of being able to assist with um, bringing down the costs of customer service. And th there's some incredible solutions on that front. In terms of using AI within Maslow, um, look, I think anything we can do to bring down um, cost, um, back, back office costs, admin, all those sorts of things we will do. Um, we, you know, I've been described by many a person as, as being not tight, but um, I'm very efficient with capital and I'm very determined to, um, you know, deliver an effective or an efficient cost base for, um, you know, as, as we scale. So where we can, where we can, uh, I guess, um, be served by employing AI, we will. Um, but obviously, um, there's a there's a big part of what we do that's about human interaction and value, and so we need to be careful as well. Cool, thank you. Um, one question is: Will that membership cost start out lower, the one referred to earlier, uh, until the value is demonstrated to potential customers? Yeah, so it's it's early in our um, in our fee iteration at the moment, but what we are uh, working on is a fee a value based fee. So our notion would be that at maturity we can sell uh, we sorry we can save an average forty five year old customer, and again that's not our primary target 
customer to start with, but they will grow into it. Um, but we can, we, we'll aim to save our average 45 year old customer somewhere between four and $6,000 per year across um, the average um, subset of financial products that that customer would have. And um, we would try and we would hope to charge that person 10% of what we save them. So we will have a value based fee. And if we're not delivering a particular customer value, then the fee will reflect that. So um, we talk about banking as, as a non-negotiable product for Maslow as a platform. And that's why we uh, spend a lot of time um, working to find an appropriate and aligned banking partner. But if we have a look at our customer base, there's no real consideration of value in transactional or savings banking, uh, saving bank accounts anymore. And so if we have a look at what in that context do you use um, banking to do or for, we approach it from the perspective of using banking as a funnel product into Maslow's broader ecosystem. So it might be that we don't charge for banking like UpBank didn't, although they're giving it a nudge now. Um, and using that relationship to then slowly educate our customer over time and show them, expose them to our ecosystem and the value that being a part of that brings and then look to charge uh, fees in a, um, a, a, a sort of a variable way based on, on the value we deliver. Great. Thank you. On that topic of uh, fees and service, uh, how will you determine who you will not work with? Yeah, so look, that's a complex answer. Basically, alignment is crucial to what we do. We can never partner with an organisation that undermines what we are trying to achieve in terms of our mission. Um, that naturally aligns us more with the mutual space um, or with some of the not-for-profit providers. There are not-for-profit healthcare providers. Um, and so... One of the wonderful things about the finance industry, whilst it's a negative for the customers at the moment, there are a lot of providers all trying to establish themselves as different when ultimately they're all pretty much selling the same sort of recolored white labeled products, banking's banking. And we see, you know, an incredible investment now and it's only going to grow in terms of um, branding and messaging. If we look at Bank Australia, I think someone mentioned them before, um, their positioning as, you know, the, the bank that doesn't invest in fossil fuels or whatever it might be. Um, and so differentiation is really important. And so for us, we will be positioning with the customer. We work for the customer. So when, in terms of who, uh, who we will work with and who we won't, it's all about how do we use their product to deliver value. And that look, it excludes a whole list, um, but it also um, pushes us towards a number who are, are very well aligned with what we're trying to do. And yeah, the, the mutuals are a big one. But if even if we step away from, I guess, the value alignment and have a look at some of the, I guess, the... Uh, um, the structures of the incumbent industry, you know, if we look at insurance as an example, or um, uh, yeah, start there. Um, if you have a look at, you know, general insurance, there's about a 30% profit margin on the retail um, side of, of general insurance. There's still a wholesaler or an underwriter, and there are many of them. And we can go to them and say, hey, we want you to write us a product for X, Y, and Z customer. We don't want to pass on the margin. And the wholesaler goes, well, great, our margins are still there. Um, but um, we don't charge any on for the to the customer, and so it's still cheaper. So in our first um, phase, which is where we use partner products to deliver our value, um, we there's you know the industry structured uh, really well for that. In our later stages, um, we get to ask some really exciting questions around, hey, we've got all these customers, they've got deposits. What if if they're not lending, then what can we do with deposits? Maybe we can put together insurance pools of capital to protect those customers against. Um, you know, Black Swan events that they pay for in separate standalone businesses at the moment, all with profit margins, all with marketing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so long term, we would like to start manufacturing some of our own products where we can beat um, providers in the market. And a really good example of that is if we have a look at um, Raise or not Stockspot because yeah, let's go with Raise as an example. It's basically a basket of, you know, ETFs. And if you look at that, I would consider that now a, a feature, not a company. You've got all these, I think they've got over a million customers all paying them a monthly fee to deliver what is essentially a feature that we could deliver to those customers as, as another way to establish value, but also not add any margin on top of it. So do so cheaper. And it's just, that's just one example. Very nice. Thank you. Um, related to that somewhat uh, from the back end, have you decided on the technology stack yet? Mina? <laughs> yes, okay, I love this type of question um, because it's not necessarily clear cut. And, and, and so what I always say is technology is basically a tool to perform a job within a specific context. Now, there needs to be this contingency approach to how we choose technology. And I tend to, you know, one size doesn't fit all. So I try and take a, a risk-based approach. Effectively, what we need is something that delivers the value while still ensuring confidentiality, confidentiality, integrity, availability, 
Um, but not only that, but the technology itself has to be supportable, has to be uh, you know flexible, adaptable, expandable to ensure that not only are we delivering a product right now, but we're looking forward to the future to ensure that we have sustainable customer outcomes. But what I can say is while this area will evolve over time as technology obviously has, um, the primary focus is going multi-cloud to be able to ensure our resilience um, and also focusing on a stable, modern, uh, financial grade technology. Thanks, Mina. Nice one. Thank you. In the offer document, so you've got a pre-money valuation. Now we're going to the fun stuff uh, of 11.5 million. Uh, so someone's made the judgment that's very high for a pre-money, pre-product fintech. How did you come up with the valuation? Yeah, so look, early stage valuations of, of companies are, despite what anyone tells you, completely made up. And that's the reality. Um, so it's about what you can make that up to and pin to. Um, so what is realistic, feasible, um, and as fair as it can be for investors, but also without trying to you know, cut off your nose to spite your face and limit your funding options later on. If we look at the size of our market and some of the success stories in the space, and let's be real, there aren't actually a lot of success stories in fintech, especially in the challenger bank-esque space. And that's another question that we'll answer in a second. But if we have a look at, um, there's really only two um, fintechs that have been at our stage um, of maturity and have had the ability to go to market with a bank product. And we've, we've got that through our banking partner. And the two, the two comparisons are um, uh, uh, UpBank, uh, which I've spoken a lot about already, but also Thrive or Thriday. And Thriday raised on virtual and they raised it at a 13 mil um, pre-money vel. And um, they had a, a much smaller total addressable market. And if we have a look at uh, just up to give us some, some figures, you know, UpBank was acquired um, by Bendigo for $116 million. Uh, they had uh, 400,000 customers, which is uh, $290 a customer. Now, we're targeting a, a million customers within five years. And the, the difference between uh, UpBank and, um, and us is that we will have revenue on, on our customers if we have that many. Um, Up are really struggling to, um, I guess, realize a, a sustainable revenue model um, because the customers that they acquired are not the typical mortgage customers. They've got 800,000 customers that they don't quite know how to monetize. And so they sold at 116 million with 400,000 customers without any revenue. And that was basically as an acquisition uh, strategy for, for Bendigo. And it was very cheap, $290 a customer is a really cheap cost of acquisition for a large bank. Um, but we would expect to be worth significantly significantly more uh, than that if we reach those same metrics because we will have revenue. Cool. Thank you. Uh, and on the topic of bank or not bank, um, we mentioned, rather you mentioned, APRA doesn't view you as a bank and therefore burden from compliance and regulation is, is less. That came up a bit earlier. How will that affect the business if the regulator changes regulations or basically if they decide that you are in the industry? Yeah, so look, there's a couple of things here. Um, our, our banking partner, obviously, we'll have, obviously, we have to um, comply with what our banking partner needs from us and that it, what they need from us comes from what APRA requires of them. And so there's a couple of non-negotiables there. Um, we will use, we, one of the reasons we haven't disclosed our banking partner is that partnership before we go to market with a product will require APRA approval. And so that's one of the reasons why we haven't disclosed it. But if we have a look at, um, I guess we could step further, a little bit further back or go a little bit higher and have a look at regulation. Regulation in the financial industry is there to mitigate or manage that conflict that exists between a party that has a financial interest in undermining a customer's outcome to make more profit and their shareholders every year want more profit. And the only tool for that company to make more money is to give less customers, sorry, to give customers less value because every financial product, everything with a product disclosure statement is selling money. And these companies have an incentive to undermine the outcome. Their tool to do that is an 80 page product disclosure statement that no one reads that. And they have competitive fiduciary duty to maximize profit. And so we've got this undermining of customer outcomes and that led to fees for no service and, and the bank, uh, the Royal Commission into, into banking misconduct in Australia. But if we have a look at the role of the regulator and one of the reasons why, you know, JP was at APRA, he's a he was a regulator and a number of the people who are on our cap table and we should probably disclaim that JP is one of those, um, are ex-regulators. And that's because we go to 
uh, in theory, to the intent of regulation. And we actually remove the conflict that they are there to mitigate, there to manage. And so we expect a lot of support from regulators, to be quite frank. And we've, we've had it from ex-regulators and we expect once we engage with them, we, we will receive that because um, we really do cut out the, one of the largest, um, uh, uh, I guess, uh, problem elements um, in, in the value chain. Thank you. Uh, and then someone's raised, it could have been asked before, uh, I don't think it was, uh, do you see your banking partner as a potential strategic investor? And if they made an offer you couldn't refuse, uh, well, they haven't worded it that way, but if they made you such an offer, um, would you accept that investment? Yeah, look, um, as a founder and as a group of founders, we have very different motivations to most people in this, in this space. Oh, I should just preface um, with that. And I think... If we have a look at our intentions, you know, I've got some pretty strong views on, on billionaires. I don't think they should exist. And the, the cap on, on our, our, our returns as, as founders means that none of us can become billionaires. And, you know, we have different drivers. We're not looking for the highest bidder. We're looking for the, the, the most impact. And so we choose partners um, along those lines. But it might be that we have a conflict at some point where a, a partner, be it a bank or otherwise, says, hey, we want to get the most out of this and we can do that by acquiring you or whatever it might be. Um, we are here for the customer and, you know, everything we've built into the constitution in terms of restrictions and limitations um, speak to that. Um, and so, you know, if we had a, a banking partner or any partner that, that was really um, challenging the underlying ethos or, or purpose of what we're doing, we're in a really strong position to be able to say to them, well, hang on a minute, I've got 200,000 customers um, who are paying me, um, who have the relationship with me as, as Maslow to give them the best outcomes and you're proposing we undermine those, we're actually going to go out and find another banking partner. And theoretically, there's nothing stopping us from taking us our, our hypothetical 200,000 customers in a few years and walking over the road to Bank Australia and saying, hey, I've got 200,000 customers who care about impact, who care about society. Um, do you want to partner up? And if my existing bank partner um, doesn't, doesn't want to play, then it, it's a really strong position to be in. Yeah, interesting. And um, yeah, we would think there's quite a bit of value in that uh, if you uh, go down that path as well. I think there is for, you know, obviously uh, it's a bit of a, it's a, um, it's an interesting one because if we do have the kind of success that, that we're hoping, um, that'll be very advantageous for our core partners and probably pretty um, detrimental to, to those that aren't. And so I think there's a, a, a lot to be said for um, first mover advantage in terms of our partners, the people that or the organizations that can see the future, see the way the world's changing and that people are demanding more of the financial uh, companies that they engage with than any company that they engage with um, and supporting um, our, uh, I guess, our, our mission to change that. And so, you know, we, we've had a number of conversations with uh, all different size of banks and, you know, if you, we spoke with Macquarie many years ago, and one of the things that they wanted to ensure was that if we had the success that we were, you know, projecting, that they could buy us. And we said, well, no. Um, and that counts them out as, as a partner. But there are many aligned partners that, that we've spoken to, that we've signed with, um, and there are a lot, lot of others in the market that would love the opportunity, especially once we're validated and have the customer acquisition component to say, hey, we can do it, um, to partner with us. So, yeah, look, the optionality for Maslow and its future customers is, is, is really good. And the thing that allows that is the, the lack of conflict in the financial products that we can offer to our customers. Beautiful. Thank you. Um, and that's naturally landed us within two minutes of uh, our official closing time. So uh, in the interest of um, timing it perfectly, um, any sort of parting thoughts or uh, take it from um, No, I think, look, I think we've covered it. Um, Mina, um, Lacey, anything else? <laughs> oh, I say if anyone, if anyone wants to book a call with me and, and pin me down and ask me questions that you didn't get a chance to answer now, um, you can book a call with me. Um, I'll, I think I've emailed everyone the link about 400 times. So, um, but reach out if you haven't got it. Um, I'm, I'm for the next 10 days. I, and well, after that, I, I work for you. So, um, call me and we'll have a chat. Wonderful. Okay. Thank you. I, I just like to say, uh, you know, thank you everyone for your time today. It's been an absolute pleasure and a privilege. Absolutely. Thanks everyone, this was so good. I just wanna say that in an early stage of a startup, the fact that you put together such an experienced team is already a big achievement and very impressive by itself. Uh, a lot of people out there struggle just to find one co-founder and all of you together, putting all of these brains together, it's beautiful, can't wait to see what you're gonna do. Thanks Layla.
Thanks, guys. Thanks, everyone, for attending. We're going to send the recording around. And if you have any questions, please uh, reach out. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Bye for now.